So good afternoon, everyone. Now. I'm not sure what time zone everyone is on, but it's actually the afternoon for those who haven't woken up yet. Um, we're going to have to. These things are quite rushed, actually. We've got. Uh, we're due to end it shortly after two o'clock, so we've just got over half an hour to really discuss this. And uh, I wanted to just say um, a big thank you to C4 for, for giving us a platform here at the Global Landscape Forum. And uh, what I'm going to do is just tell you a little bit about the Little Book series. I think most of you may have remember the Little Red Book, which we launched back in 2008 after the Barley Cop, which Reds really got legs. And uh, since then, I don't know why, just everybody seems to want another one every year. People keep running up to me and saying, I want another one for our box set, which I have on the mantelpiece. Well, here is the latest one. And uh, where's Louisa? Is it the seventh or the eighth? I can't remember. It's the seventh book. So the seventh little book. And this has been a little different because we have worked with a huge range of collaborative partners who have helped us do this. And I think the purpose is really to try to demystify what we mean by a landscape and a landscape approach. And in that good old little book way, we've tried to keep it simple and then add some catalysts which uh, might help us get to where we all want to go. I particularly just want to thank the partners who have uh, worked with us uh, for so long on this over the last year or so, uh, the Worldwide Fund for Nature and Eco Agriculture Partners, the Nature Conservancy, IDH, uh, the Sustainable Trade Initiative, and also the GIZ, which is the German Development Organization, uh, TNC the for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN, C4, uh, GEF even, the Global Environment Facility, the World Agroforestry Center, Tropenboss International, UNEP, and the World Bank's Terra Africa project. Now, if between us we can't come up with an answer, um, then I don't think anybody can on what we mean by a landscape. Um, and it's been a very fascinating collaboration. You can find everything in here uh, about it. But what I'm going to do now is just introduce the speakers who are going to be taking us through various aspects of this book over the next 30 minutes or so. First of all, there's Peter Graham who's a leader of the World Wildlife Fund Forest and Climate Program. Peter's responsible for overseeing World Wildlife work on forest and climate issues. Sarah Shear is the founding president and CEO of Eco Agriculture Partners. She's an agricultural and natural resource economist specializing in land management policy in tropical developing countries. Fitrian, and I, I'm sure I'm going to get your name wrong, Fitrian, again, but listen. Uh, Adrian, mm, hang on, let me have another go at it. Let's keep it. Adrian Fa. Near enough, wasn't it? Okay, well, okay. great to have you here, Fitrian, uh, in Indonesia. He's country director at IDH uh, in Indonesia, long-standing experience, and a PhD in sustainable landscapes management. And then Corina Walrap is advisor for G uh, GIZ and has been working for the last two years in the Kailash Sacred Landscape and Conservation and Development Initiative. Uh, where is that? Nepal. In Nepal. China. Great, in the ball and in India, three countries. So we've got a very interesting panel. Without more ado, I'm going to try and moderate the session and keep everyone to time. So I'm going to turn it over now. Who's this first speaker? Is that going to be you, Graham? It is. So, Peter, over to you, Peter. Thank you very much. Is this on? Just a second. Well, we need a microphone on. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here on this distinguished panel. And it's no co coincidence that we're here to launch this book uh, at this time in Paris on the cusp of a new UN uh, Comprehensive Climate Change Agreement. The international and domestic commitments to address climate change are made in the context of sustainable development. And reaching those sustainable development goals will depend on our ability to both learn from experience and take advantage of political will, new policies and tools, including uh, international climate finance for reducing deforestation and forest degradation. Now, we know what the challenges are. The, as as, uh, as uh, was uh, explained, there's a vast group of people that have been involved in this project, and uh, the experiences and challenges that were described in the book, or have been described, include, among the top ones, the, the leadership and sustained political will to do the right thing. That is a key challenge. Um, also, achieving impact at scale, and moving from collaboration to integration of production and protection activities on the landscape. Now, of these three that I've selected, we have some good examples of solutions. So that's the good news. On political will, here in Paris, um, we've seen that the, in the submission of uh, intended nationally determined contributions, if I use the, the technical term, 
um, to combat climate change under the new UN, UN agreement includes many, many countries committing to action in the forest and land sector. Also, at the beginning of this past week, um, on Monday, 17 governments from both North and South committed to concrete action to reduce tropical deforestation and degradation. Among these in particular, there was a commitment of at least $5 billion over the next five years from Germany, Norway, and UK for such action. In addition, we saw a commitment, further commitment from the private sector, including from Chinese companies and uh, in industries, associations, excuse me, um, to eliminate deforestation from their supply chains. The second problem is achieving impact at scale, and we look at landscapes as the minimum scale for which to effectively deal with the key issues of modern natural resource governance. Firstly, to maintain functioning uh, biological systems, to address the economic realities, complexities, and demands, to address the scale of climate change mitigation adaptation needs, as well as this looking at the actual scale of institutions and where political decisions are made. So, scattered projects, we've learned, are not necessarily sufficient to achieve the impacts that we need. Now, within a coherent national framework for climate change and sustainable development, it's critical that we apply planning at the jurisdictional and landscape level. This is the level where the economy meets the environment, where people live their lives, make their living, where the impact of land use decisions have immediate impact on people and their environment. While the international and national policies and regulations can provide clear direction and enabling conditions, Jurisdictions and landscape level action is what our joint efforts here need to focus on. The implementation of holistic, integrated land use planning and landscape level action is today the main obstacle to success and is the approach that will help close the still too wide gap between commitments and real conservation. So, integrated landscape management offers a systematic approach to address the root causes of the complex problem. And complexities are as real as we've realized in implementation of activities uh, to achieve Red Plus objectives as the complexities of the international negotiations themselves. We've learned a lot from both. Looking at the broad landscape level or scale offers the opportunity to address far greater composites, excuse me, a far greater composite of factors across sectors and stakeholders from the outset. If you go a minute, less than a minute left. I'm just about done, which should increase the probability of successful outcomes. So the message of this little Sustainable Landscapes book is just that. We have to think globally, act locally, together across our landscapes. And on behalf of all the people at uh, WWF, including my good friend Paul Chatterton, I'd like to thank all the contributors for such a successful outcome. Thank Thanks very much, uh, Peter. I do want to take some questions from the floor, so I'm going to keep you tight to time. Off you go. Okay, Good afternoon to everyone. I'm going to start my intervention by those of you who picked up a little book on your way in to say that there's a glossary on page 10. And I thought it might be useful for some of you. Uh, one of the things we've been, I think, arguing about over the last decade has been what is the definition of a landscape. And we put our heads together after much discussion and much consultation. And we are simply saying that a landscape is a socio-ecological system that consists of natural and or human modified ecosystems, and which is influenced by distinct sociological, historical, economic, and sociocultural processes and activities. And by integrated landscape management, we mean, this is a little longer, a way of managing the landscape that involves collaboration among multiple stakeholders with the purpose of achieving sustainable landscapes. The governance structure, size and scope, and number and type of stakeholders involved, private sector, civil society, government, etc., can vary. The level of cooperation also varies, from simply information sharing and consultation to more formal models with shared decision making and joint implementation. And I am proud to use those definitions because they were hard won. <laughs> But I think when people are looking at this who have not been involved in it, they say it is really hard. Working across sectors, working across stakeholder groups, it generates conflict. They have different mindsets, different values, and different priorities. Yet, in some of the most challenging landscapes around the world, these whole landscape partnerships are actually proliferating. 
A recent study, which is illustrated in the poster right below me and on page 52 of your little book, uh, it represents uh, an exercise that was done by the Landscapes for People, Food, and Nature Initiative, of which most of us are our partners, uh, that documented 365 integrated landscape management initiatives around the world in Africa, South and Southeast Asia, and Latin America. And there's one coming out for Europe that just wasn't ready to include in the book. Uh, and on average, these included five to seven different sectors and six to 11 different stakeholder groups. And what we wanted to do with this little book was to draw from that broad experience to say, what are the core lessons that have been learned about implementing integrated landscape management? And we came up with five key elements. The first one, establish a multi-stakeholder platform. And the critical issues are who do you bring in, how do you engage them, and how can they interact, and how can they be well facilitated? The second point, element, you need to generate a share and understanding. People do start with very different information and perspectives. How can they share their perspectives? Uh, how can they understand the spatial linkages between what farmers do in this place and what happens in forests somewhere else? A third aspect is to do collaborative planning, not separate planning and then try to mesh them, uh, but to figure out where are the intersections, how are you going to try to generate synergies between the groups, how are you going to avoid and re reduce the kind of trade-offs. Fourthly, a lot of attention to effective implementation, good communication, finding early wins that the, the, that the partners can, can do together, um, having very good leadership and regular kinds of, of, of get-togethers. And fifth, it's really important to monitor for both the learning for adaptive management and also for accountability. Now, one of the things that we all recognize that is that achieving these landscape management efforts um, can be made easier or harder by some very important factors. And so those we call catalysts. One is around governance. How do you get public agencies to coordinate together across scales and sectors? How do you handle tenure issues? How do you enable public participation so all the voices are heard in these negotiations? Secondly, finance. How can we get rid of, of unhelpful subsidies? Uh, how do we promote the kind of investments, in integrated investments? How do we get financing for that? Um, how do we coordinate? How do we use new, new efforts um, for fiscal policy? And finally, the markets catalyst. Um, how can we make it good business for all the partners to be involved in sustainable landscapes? And we look at a diversity of experience around payments for ecosystems, markets that will allow more diversification of products from the landscape, ecotourism, et cetera. So there's a lot of fun stuff in there. And I think we, if I have a minute to conclude. Do Actually, have, you don't. I don't. OK. I, was gonna give them, I will point to you the final conclusion section in which we lay out five key actions for movement. And I think the number one there is to look at how the integrated landscape management approach can be used to implement the sustainable development goals and many of the others flow from that. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here, uh, representing not only Indonesia, but also IDH in general. Uh, I would like to start by saying that I think, as uh, those of you uh, know IDH, uh, we've been learning from our commodity initiatives throughout the supply chain uh, that has, to some extent, improved uh, not only the productivity, but also uh, the experience, uh, the practices of, of those sectors and concessions. But it's not sufficient. Why? Because uh, we've learned that there are so many cross-sectoral challenges that we need to tackle at really larger level, or at the landscape level. Just to name some, some key challenges, the leg legality of land of smallholders, uh, pit of forest management at the large landscape level, water or hydrological system, uh, because one concession can uh, do a lot of things, but if the neighboring concession will not do anything about it, it will be disastrous. Uh, look at the fires uh, that happened in Indonesia, for instance. Social dimension, social conflicts. And of course, improving productivity of smallholders, small farmers, because I think if you talk about uh, one particular company, uh, it cannot only uh, this kind of company responsibility to take over or to take care of this uh, uh, smallholders, small farmers throughout the supply chain. So there's need to be combinations of improving productivity, protection, restorations at a larger landscape. And that, that is why I think IDH uh, uh, has realized, or we have realized that 
there's need to be uh, something uh, concrete, but also something uh, uh, ideological that we need to change at really uh, high level, uh, larger le level, at landscape level. So uh, we do think that uh, the launching of this little sustainable landscape book, uh, it's a little, but it's large in, in many ways. Uh, it's, it's huge, it's, it's a good starting point, not only to discuss, but also to have this kind of idea to be grounded uh, in countries like Indonesia, Brazil, and many other countries in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America. Uh, because uh, we see that not only companies, but also there's a need to get the uh, involvement of, of uh, national government, uh, sub-national government, and also local government uh, down to village level. Uh, this is uh, really concrete uh, in, in the context of changing the behavior, not only uh, you know, big players like, like companies, but also many other actors uh, that, that use the land and also use the natural resources uh, on the ground. And uh, I think we, we have uh, set up, or initially set up uh, seven to nine landscape, it could be more now. Uh, I cannot uh, trace back the history of IDH uh, because I've uh, just joined this year, but I think Ninke, for instance, the one that also contributed to this book, uh, could explain more about that and also some uh, IDH people here and my team in, in, in Indonesia, there are some few here. Uh, but for the context of Indonesia, uh, we are trying to experience or to, to initiate uh, at least three landscapes in three provinces in South Sumatra, West Kalimantan and Aceh. There are a couple of, uh, or more than a couple of uh, important things that we reckon that needs to be, to be addressed. Uh, first, of course, the issues of, of spatial planning. Uh, how then we can, uh, you know, initiate some discussions, debate, uh, concretely about the forming spatial planning because that's uh, one critical aspect in the context of Indonesia and the landscape. The green growth plan, uh, you know, sectoral initiatives, but also uh, ensuring that improving productivity uh, will be done in the context of also uh, retaining or maintaining or protecting uh, the remaining ecosystem. And of course, uh, co-financing or investment that Sarah has already mentioned. Investments not only for particular commodities, uh, farmers or whatever, but also in the context of la landscape in general. Uh, what we call, for instance, their risking facility for small players, because banks, for instance, are not willing to finance small players because it's too risky for them. And of course, the financing for restoration and, 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 and protections. Just to have a legal cost, uh, if you take into account legal cost alone for protection and restoration in Indonesia is huge. One particular ecosystem restoration mm, that has 150,000 hectares, you need to pay uh, up, uh, up front uh, around uh, six to eight million dollars for 60 years. I mean, so you need to pay up front. So you need to also address this kind of uh, <coughs> barriers to be able to have companies, communities, as well as government to get involved in this large landscape. I think that's uh, our key point, and thanks so much for inviting us and also supporting this uh, good endeavor. Thank you. Yeah, namaste, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Kailash team. It's the Kailash Sacred Landscape Conservation and Development Initiative. It is facilitated and coordinated by ECMOD um, and uh, supported by GIZ uh, on behalf of the German government as well as um, UK aid. Um, ECMOD is uh, the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development. Um, in the Hindu Kush Himalaya range and uh, in the last years they have set up a six transboundary landscape program in the region and uh, the Kailash project is the one which is most advanced in the implementation so far. Um, so what is the Kailash sacred landscape? Uh, the Mount Kailash uh, is the most sacred mountain for the Buddhists and Hindus in, in Asia and the Kailash sacred landscape encompasses of uh, parts of Tibetan autonomous region in China, where the Kailash is located, as well as the parts of India, as well as Nepal. So um, this area has very strong cultural and ecological linkages, um, but as well there are a lot of impacts of drivers of change which um, are affecting that area. So due to uh, climate change issues, we have uh, lack of innovative livelihoods, um, over excessive use of natural resources. Um, so many of these um, issues are transparently on, on, on a landscape level. So these three countries, China, Nepal and India, they realized uh, that it needs a joint as well as a multidisciplinary approach um, to be able to conserve and to develop that very sacred landscape for that, uh, for that region. 
Um, so, yeah, so the question is how did it work? So, we, we are, I'm speaking here for an implementation project. Um, so I want to raise uh, and I want to raise two points, and uh, these are achievements as well as lessons learned from our project. So one, the it's uh, Sarah she she has presented quite nicely. So at first you need a common understand a multi-sectoral platform. You need common understanding, etc. So that first part it took us quite long to get started actually. Um, we used a consultative and iterative project a uh, process, um, but it was. It was essential to be able uh, to develop the, the main project documents, which is the regional cooperation framework, as well as uh, the conservation and development strategy. So even it took long, it was very necessary to, to have that process. First, to have a real common understanding between these three countries, what we want to achieve in that, in that area. The second is also to building up the trust between the different partners and stakeholders. And, uh, and the third is also to encourage um, the ownership of uh, the countries to take that uh, project along. Um, the second learning I want to stress on, it's obvious, but I think we sometimes forget how much efforts that take, is the point of communication, coordination and team building, especially in an area of uh, trans if in a transboundary project, um, it's essential to have a good teamwork at the end. Um, and uh, also, it's, it is presented in the book that we start first with the multi-stakeholder platform, then it moves on to the common, common understanding, then it moves on in the implementation process. In reality, of course, all these are interlinked with each other. So even if we start uh, with a common understanding, things are changing over, over time. So it needs continuously, um, again, reviving these common, uh, re yeah, reviewing and reviving this uh, common understanding. Uh, new stakeholders come along during the process of implementation. So even if we if we want to upscale a project from a pilot site up to a, a landscape level, um, it needs again common uh, knowledge management, at least uh, good communication, to be able to to reach from a pilot site up to a landscape level. Um, so there's uh, need for communities to exchange. There's need for nations to exchange to be able to, to link up from local, national, up to a, to a regional level. Um, thank you. I think we're going to have to end it there, unless okay. you've got one final point you need to make. Um, yeah, so some of these knowledge management products um, we have developed are quite uh, unique, I would say. Uh, we are also there at the Pavilion, and if you have further questions, um, yeah, please feel free to contact. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.